lesson carries on from lesson 3a, where we looked at intermolecular interactions. Now, we're going to look specifically at the interaction between certain substances and water. In other words, we're going to look at how things dissolve. This is really important because we are water-based beings. And this course, as well as the other ones to follow, all build on each other to the end goal of empowering people to take control of their health and improve their likelihood of living as, as long and, and healthy and beautiful as possible. And if you want to get there, but you don't know how interactions with water happen, then you don't know how any chemical reaction in the body can take place in this water background or stage that we have. We're going to apply our principles to even see why dermal fillers attract water and why moisturizers can actually dry out your skin which is why I never use one, by the way, and neither do any of my patients that bother to listen to me. We'll look first at why some things dissolve in water and why others don't. Uh, to understand solubility in water, let's revisit what we know about water being a polar molecule. If you remember, because of the electronegativity of oxygen that pulls negative electrons in the bond towards itself, water has a permanent dipole. Oxygen's got a slight negative charge and the hydrogens have a slight positive charge. This means water molecules act like tiny magnets able to interact with other charged or polar substances nearby. Polar substances can have solubility for particular reasons as well. As substances that are polar, like water with its slight positive and negative charges, or ones that carry full charges, tend to dissolve in water because they can interact with this oxygen-hydrogen dipole. For example, water molecules interact with other water molecules because each slight charge sticks to another slight charge that's the opposite. Sodium chloride or table salt also interacts with water because its full charge interacts with the opposite slight charge in the water molecules. Now, when you drop a polar substance into water, Water molecules surround it and form stabilizing interactions through hydrogen bonds and charge-to-charge -charge interactions. This process is called hydration or solvation, and it's what makes polar substances dissolve. It's what we're trying to achieve by using things like moisturizers and injectable skin boosters that promise hydration. The hydration these companies are trying to create is through hydration shells or solvation shells, which are in a light blue in this diagram. Sometimes we say spheres instead of shells too. Same thing, doesn't matter. You can get multiple spheres or shells of water surrounding one charged ion too. How many shells you get depends on how strong the ion's charge is to attract the polar ends of the water molecules from a distance. The distance a magnet can attract iron filings depends on how strong the magnet is. The stronger a magnet is, the further away it can make something move. The stronger an ion's charge is, the further away from which it can attract water. Now, in dermal fillers, ions move to where the hyaluronic acid is negative, and these ions can attract hydration shells. Moisturizers try the same thing with hyaluronic acid in the ingredients. But because they can't penetrate into the proper depth and stay shallow, they attract water out of the skin to where the cream is. And that's why the day you forget to put it on, your skin feels dry. Because a moisturizer has used hyaluronic acid, which has attracted the water out of your skin to make solvation shells for the surface instead of where the cells need it below. Let's look at sodium chloride as an example here. So sodium chloride, or table salt, if you like, is a classic example of a substance dissolving in water due to its interaction with water's dipole. Salt is made up of charged ions, positively charged sodium ions, an A+, and negatively charged chloride ions, Cl-. Here's what happens when you add NaCl to water. In the first step, we break the lattice. In the solid NaCl, the ions are held together by strong charge-to-charge -charge interactions. When it enters water, the water molecules as dipoles interact with these ions. 
So the slightly positive hydrogen side of water is attracted to the chloride and the slightly negative oxygen side of the water is attracted to the sodium, Na+. In the second step, hydration shell formation, sometimes we call them hydrate shells too, uh, is, is where water molecules surround the individual Na plus and Cl minus ions, forming a hydration shell. And this breaks the strong ionic bond between the ions and keeps them dissolved in solution without them gluing back into each other like when they were a solid before being dropped or mixed into water. In the third step, we get a solution formation. You see, once hydrated, once these spheres have been made around the ions, the ions are dispersed very evenly in the water, creating a solution. And the ability of water to stabilize charged particles in this way is what makes it such an excellent solvent for ionic and polar substances, which can be surrounded by water's appropriate dipole ends. But why don't nonpolar substances dissolve in water though? Well, substances like oils or methyl groups from lesson 3a don't dissolve in water. These don't have charges or dipoles to interact with water where something is more electronegative and creates a dipole of positive and negative. So water molecules can't form hydration shells around them. Instead, the nonpolar molecules with no relatively positive and negative bits to interact with water, then just clump together to avoid disrupting water's hydrogen bonding network, which is why oil and water don't mix. And that's the hydrophobic effects at work in your day-to-day -day life. It's like saying magnets are polar, so they attract other magnets, which also have a north and a south, or positive and negative. But then when you have a magnet next to some plastic, right, nothing happens because plastic isn't magnetic, right? This is you know, a layman version of polar and non-polar stuff interacting. But polar stuff mixes into water because water is also polar. It has polarity, a, a positive and a negative end. I'm going to connect this to what we saw in previous lessons so you can draw some connections in your, in your mind as well. Water's polarity and a dipole structure, positive and negative, allow it to dissolve ionic compounds like sodium chloride and polar substances with groups like OH or COOH from when we looked at functional groups, if you remember. If you're interested, other groups that can give solubility include things like carbonyl groups, C double bond O, which is why glucose can be soluble, aldehydes, which are CHO, which is another way glucose is soluble, sulfhydryl groups, like SH, sulfur hydrogen, which is why amino acids like cysteine are soluble, and also amine, NH2 groups, which is why amino acids in general have some level of solubility as well. Now, the more of these soluble groups, or the more, say, hydroxyl groups a molecule has, then the more soluble it can be. And the more methyl groups, or similar, a molecule has, then the less soluble it can be. So solubility is kind of like a spectrum Two things can both be soluble, while one can be more soluble than the other because it's got more hydroxyl groups. In other words, it can make more hydrogen bonds in water. Nonpolar molecules, which are lacking charges or dipoles, don't interact favorably with water and instead create hydrophobic interactions, as we saw in the formation of membranes and protein folding in the, in the previous lesson. This interplay of polar and non-polar behavior is fundamental to life. From how nutrients dissolve in our blood to how cell, cell membranes keep their structure. You know, understand all the lessons up till now and you'll understand better. Things like diet, cosmetic treatments, medication, much more. You know, amphipathic molecules are how we actually bridge the polar and non-polar worlds together. Amphipathic molecules are like double agents. They have two very different sides to their structure. One side's polar, hydrophilic or water-loving, and the other side's non-polar, hydrophobic or water-fearing. And having both, that, that dual nature, allows them to interact with both polar and non-polar substances, water and oil, making them critical in biological systems. Bile is something you might want to look up to see why things like this are important, as well as having a well-functioning gallbladder. Cholesterol 
is another good example. See if you can Google a picture of cholesterol's chemical structure and explain which bits are polar and which bits are non-polar. You're expert enough to analyze it and say why it has a degree of solubility now. A classic example um, of an amph amphipathic molecule is a lipid, specifically phospholipids, which are essential for forming cell membrane and bilayers. Phospholipids are amphipathic because their structure includes uh, both a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. So the hydrophilic head of a phospholipid contains a phosphate group, PO4, 3 minus, which is negatively charged. This makes the head polar and capable of interacting with water via hydrogen bonding and charge to charge interactions. The hydrophobic tails are made up of long hydrocarbon chains, chains of carbon and hydrogen atoms, which are nonpolar and hydrophobic. These tails don't mix with water and prefer to avoid it. And this combination of hydrophilic and hydrophobic react, uh, regions makes phospholipids ampi amphipathic. When they're placed in water, they spontaneously arrange themselves into a bilayer. Here's why and how this happens. So, the hydrophilic heads interact with water. These heads are attracted to water. So they face outward toward the watery environment, both inside and outside the cell. The hydrophilic tail, hydrophobic tails, avoid water. And these nonpolar tails clump together to escape water. And so to minimize their contact with water, their tails face inwards, shielded from the surrounding water by the polar heads. Then there's the actual bilayer formation. So the combination of both processes, where the hydrophilic heads form the outer surfaces of the bilayer, and the hydrophobic tails are tucked inside, the result is a stable membrane with a hydrophobic core to act as a barrier. And this amphipathic nature gives it unique properties that are essential for life. There's a selective barrier. The hydrophobic core prevents most polar and, and charged molecules from passing through while allowing non-polar molecules to diffuse very freely, like fatty acids. And this selectivity is critical for controlling what enters and exits the cell. It's, it's why fatty acids can enter the cell pretty easily to be used as fuel. Um, but glucose needs some help getting in. It's also dynamic and flexible. The bilayer isn't rigid. The lipids can move laterally, and that allows the membranes to be fluid and adaptable. It's also self-sealing. If the bilayer is disrupted, the amphipathic nature of phospholipids causes it to just self-reassemble, maintaining the integrity of the membrane so the cell stands the best chance possible of staying viable after things like trauma. An example of this is something like microneedling, which causes cells to get damaged. If you're still watching, I hope you're starting to see why I have so many different subjects on this channel, um, on my YouTube channel, you know, cosmetic treatments, skincare, injectables, drugs, heart disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're all just scaled up versions of the fundamental sciences. So if you learn this, then you have a, a better understanding of all those different subjects all at the same time. In the next lesson, we're going to go through an understanding of how oxygen is given to parts of the body in order for us to stay alive and obviously perform as well as possible in things like exercise. That'll probably be the last video of the course here on YouTube and the one after that will probably go into the free school group where I can do a whole lot more teaching than just pre-made videos. We're going to have group uh, discussions on each lesson for classroom style teaching and then apply it to actual products on the market like different skincare and drugs and injectables. Stay tuned.